I'm the author of Kamala and Maya's Big Idea, written by me and illustrated by Ana Ramirez Gonzalez. All right, let's start reading. No, it's a little bright. You know what should be out there? Kamala asked her sister Maya. Us? said Maya. A slide, said Kamala. And a swing, Maya added. A playground, they shouted together. Kamala and Maya had an idea. It was a very good idea and a very big idea. They were going to need help. Wouldn't it be great if there was a playground in the courtyard, Maya said. That does sound nice, Mommy agreed. How can we make that happen? Kamala asked. Well, I suppose the first step would be to ask the landlord, the person who owns the building. So Kamala wrote a letter and Maya drew a picture and they went to see the landlord to discuss their idea. The landlord thought about it for less than a second. Mm, I don't think so, no. Uh oh, I'm so sorry. That was not the answer they wanted, but they were not ready to give up. That night, the sisters tried to think of ways to turn a no into a yes. They asked the other kids in the building if they wanted a playground in the courtyard. Did they? Of course they did. And they had ideas too. Let's have a teeter totter and a basketball hoop and flowers. So Kamala wrote a longer letter and they went to see the landlord together. Should we read this letter? All right, dear landlord, right now the courtyard of our building is empty and no one uses it. If there were swings, kids could fly high. If there was a sandbox, kids could build. If there was a slide, kids could go so far, so fast. Can you build it please? The landlord thought about it for less than five seconds. A project this big is expensive. We don't have money for that. Do your parents know you're here? Ugh, this was not the answer they wanted, but Kamala was not ready to give up. If we ask our parents and do it all ourselves, can we fix up the courtyard? The landlord thought about that for a whole 10 seconds. Finally, he shrugged. If you can do it yourselves, sure. This wasn't exactly the answer they wanted, but it was a start. The kids all spoke to their parents about the ideas for the courtyard. They hung up posters and knocked on neighbors' doors. But they got the same answers from everyone. I'm sorry. Wow, that is a big job. Ugh, wish I could help which they knew meant no, no, no. But then Mr. Green stopped to talk. I work construction and I can maybe get some scrap lumber and some sand for a sandbox. <gasps> really? Kamala said, yes, exclaimed Maya. Okay, I'll try. It wasn't a yes, but right now maybe was the sweetest word they had ever heard. Maybe gave them hope. The next weekend, maybe, turned into yes. The kids all helped measure and Mr. Green cut the boards. Then they sanded and hammered and sanded some more and then came the actual sand. They were all thanking Mr. Green when Ms. Lopez stopped to talk. I work at a garage. Maybe they have an extra tire for a teeter-totter. <gasps> Another maybe. In the weeks that followed, lots of I don't knows turned into maybes and then yeses. No one could do everything, but everyone could do something. Kamala and Maya wanted everyone to celebrate the new playground, so they made another big poster inviting their neighbors to a potluck party. There were hot dogs and hummus, spicy chicken and potato salad, strawberries and brownies and lemonade. Mrs. Flores set up a sprinkler for the kids to run through and Mr. Green brought the music. 
Kamala admired the new playground, but she noticed there is still one thing missing. I wonder what it is. No one knew how to make a slide, but Ms. Flores knew where they might buy one. I teach at Emerson Elementary and they're redoing their playground. Maybe we could buy the old slide? This was a different kind of maybe. A how can we afford that maybe? But now everyone was trying to find a way to turn that maybe into a yes. These brownies are delicious. Maybe we could have a bake sale. We can all bring toys and books and have a sidewalk sale. No one could do everything, but everyone could contribute something. When the slide arrived at last, Maya and Kamala got the first ride. The landlord was impressed. I wanna shake your hands, girls, he said. You did a good job. You all did a good job. Kamala and Maya had an idea. It was a very good idea and a very big idea. And with a lot of help, they made it happen. Hooray for Kamala and Maya! Hooray for the Persisters! What's next, Kamala? Kamala, looking up, said, I'm wondering what the view is like from the roof. The end. So that's the end of my book. And in the back, there are lots of very special pictures. This one right here you can see is Maya and Kamala, my mom and aunt, sitting there on the rock back to back. And it actually inspired the cover where they're standing there back to back. You see that? And then this is another picture of them when they were little girls looking very stylish and fierce. Uh, this picture here is uh, very special to me. It's of my grandmother with Kamala and Maya when they were little girls. My grandmother was a huge important figure in all of our lives and is very special to me. And then finally, this is the three of us as adults. <laughs> and that was, oh my gosh, almost two years ago now in Oakland when Kamala announced that she was going to run for president. And here we are now when she's running for vice president. It's two years later and we're still, still working. So that's my book. I'm so thankful for the opportunity to read it to all of you. And now I have another book to read to you. This one is called Last Stop on Market Street. And I just love this book. It's written by Matt De La Pena, who is an author who I just look up to so much and has been a, a huge uh, source of inspiration for me. And of course, it's illustrated by Christian Robinson, who uh, is from California, like me, and lived in San Francisco for many, many years. I'm here now in San Francisco. Um, and Market Street is also in San Francisco. So I thought this would be a special book to read to all of you. So here we are. All right, last stop on Market Street. CJ pushed through the church doors, skipped down the steps. The outside air smelled like freedom, but it also smelled like rain, which freckled CJ's shirt and dripped down his nose. He ducked under his Nana's umbrella saying, how come we got to wait for the bus in all this wet? Trees get thirsty too, his Nana told him. Don't you see that big one drinking through a straw? CJ looked for a long time, but never saw a straw. The bus creaked to a stop in front of them. It sighed and sagged and the doors swung open. What's that I see, Mr. Dennis asked. He pulled a coin from behind CJ's ear and placed it in his palm. Nana laughed her deep laugh and pushed CJ along. They sat right up front. The man across the way was tuning a guitar an old woman with curlers had butterflies in a jar. Nana gave everyone a great big smile and a good afternoon. She made sure CJ did the same.
The bus lurched forward and stopped, lurched forward and stopped. Nana hummed as she knit. How come we always got to go here after church? CJ asked. Miguel and Colby never have to go nowhere. I feel sorry for those boys, she told him. They'll never get a chance to meet Bobo or the sunglass man. And I hear Trixie got herself a brand new hat. CJ stared out the window, feeling sorry for himself. He watched cars zip by on either side, watched a group of boys hop curbs on bikes. A man climbed aboard with a spotted dog. CJ gave up his seat. How come that man can't see? Boy, what do you know about seeing? Nana told him. Some people watch the world with their ears. That's a fact. Their noses too, the man said, sniffing at the air. That's a mighty fine perfume you're wearing today, ma'am. Nana squeezed the man's hand and laughed her deep laugh. Two older boys got on next. CJ watched as they moved by and stood in back. Sure wish I had one of those, he said. Nana set down her knitting. What for? You got the real live thing sitting across from you. Why don't you ask the man if he'll play us a song? CJ didn't have to. The guitar player was already plucking strings and beginning to sing. To feel the magic of music, the blind man whispered. I like to close my eyes. Nana closed hers too. So did CJ and the spotted dog. And in the darkness, the rhythm lifted CJ out of the bus, out of the busy city. He saw sunset colors swirling over crashing waves. He saw a family of hawks slicing through the sky, saw the old woman's butterflies dancing free in the light of the moon. CJ's chest grew full and he was lost in the sound and the sound gave him the feeling of magic. The song ended and CJ opened his eyes. Everyone on the bus clapped, even the boys in the back. Nana glanced at the coin in CJ's palm. CJ dropped it in the man's hat. Last stop on Market Street, Mr. Dennis called. CJ looked around as he stepped off the bus, crumbling sidewalks and broken down doors, graffiti tagged windows and boarded up stores. He reached for his Nana's hand. How come it's always so dirty over here? She smiled and pointed to the sky. Sometimes when you're surrounded by dirt, CJ, you're a better witness for what's beautiful. CJ saw the perfect rainbow arcing over their soup kitchen. He wondered how his Nana always found beautiful where he never even thought to look. He looked all around them again at the bus rounding the corner out of sight and the broken street lamps still lit up bright and the stray cat shadows moving across the wall. When he spotted their familiar faces in the window, he said, I'm glad we came. He thought his Nana might laugh her deep laugh, but she did not She patted him on the head and told him, me too, CJ. Now, come on. The end, and there they are at the end at the bus stop again. And that is the last stop on Market Street by Matt De La Pena, illustrated by Christian Robinson. And those are my two books that I'm so excited to read to you today. Um, I'm looking at the questions on the Q&A, so I'll answer a couple questions. And this one says, was your book based on a true story? Um, so yes, my book, Kamala and Maya's Big Idea is based on a true story from the childhood of my aunt Kamala and mom Maya. And 
Um, obviously, I just read it to you all, but it's about um, when they were growing up in, in, in their apartment building and they saw that there was a space in the in the courtyard that wasn't being used. And um, I believe if, the, if I'm remembering the story correctly, that my mom wanted to play soccer. <laughs> my mom was um, very athletic and loved sports and they wanted to create a place where children could play. And uh, my aunt has talked about it a lot as sort of, you know, their first act of activism. And uh, they, you know, created this whole campaign of bringing their community together to ask the landlord if they could turn it into a, an area for kids to play. And that's exactly what the book is about. And as we all know, um, obviously, I use some imagination and, and other, uh, you know, things to add in, but um, they, they built a playground for themselves and they leaned on their community and understood the strength of their community and they had a big idea and they went after it and they got it done. Oh, I think you're oh, on. Oh, there you are. There we go. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for reading that. If anyone else has any questions, you can go ahead and um, put those in right now. Oh, we're getting a few in. Uh, somebody here in the chat is asking, that they're saying they missed the first part of your reading. What city is it set in, your book? So uh, I, I like that question. We actually don't say in the book what city it is set in. So it can be set in any city that you like. Um, the true story at this time in their lives, my mom and aunt were uh, living in Montreal. My grandmother was working there at that time. Um, but we also grew up uh, mainly in Oakland and in Berkeley. So when I wrote this, that's where I imagined that they were. Um, so that's what I you know, was saying that I used my uh, imagination for parts of the book, but drew on what was a true story from their childhood. So when I wrote it and, and when I read it, I imagine Oakland, California, which is where I'm from. And there's another question, do I play soccer? Oh my goodness, no, I don't play soccer. I, I wish I had frankly done more sports when I was a kid. Uh, my girls, um, they're two and four years old. They love sports, they love running around. And so I'm encouraging them to play soccer. Um, I did not play soccer. I actually did play basketball briefly and I ran track briefly, but I was not as uh, athletic. I was really creative growing up, so. I was always doing arts uh, and, and drawing and painting. And um, I think that's also what eventually really inspired me to write a kid's book because it's part of my creative expression. Thank you. Are you working on any new kid's books that you're writing? I am actually, I just announced, I think it was two weeks ago. Uh, so I just announced that I'm writing uh, my second kid's book. It comes out on January 19th, I'm actually very on brand. I'm just realizing this, I'm wearing a sweatshirt that says ambitious and the title of the book is Ambitious Girl. And I'm so excited about it. It really is um, totally different than Kamala and Maya's big idea and really helped me to grow as an author and to stretch myself. And I'm so, so excited about it. It is about a little girl who is um, an ambitious girl. And it's really around uh, the meaning of that word and the meaning of the word ambitious and, and what that means to us, especially um, thinking about, you know, how we as a society often tell women and girls to hide their ambition or, you know, that ambition is a bad thing or, um, you know, that we're too ambitious, right? And, and really thinking about that language and, and how to claim our power. And that, and as I was taught when I grew up, that ambition is a good thing and it's something to aspire to. It means your purpose and, and self-determination. It means having a big idea, right? Uh, like Kamala and Maya had in this book. Um, so I'm really excited about it and it comes out very soon. So um, you can pre-order it now uh, online and it will be out on January 19th in just a few months. Excellent. What was your favorite book when you were a kid? Oh goodness, this is a, people ask me this one a lot and I guess I should probably have a, a better answer. Um, you know, I was, we started reading more of some of the older books that I read when I was a kid. Obviously they're the um, amazing classics like um, uh, Good Night Moon and I loved Where the Wild Things Are. That was a, a favorite of mine. Um, I, we recently uh, picked up Tar Beach, which is a really wonderful um, book. Um, it has beautiful, beautiful art in it. So that was a favorite of mine. But I have to tell you that, you know, part of becoming uh, an author, part of the motivation, I mean, there are so many 
things that, you know, influenced me to do, to write a book, but really one of them was the lack of diversity in children's books. And when I think back to what I read, you know, uh, Tar Beach is obviously a, an exception to that, but so many of the books that I read growing up didn't have, you know, main characters of color, certainly not, you know, two uh, little black girls as the, you know, protagonists and, and, and leaders in the books. And so that's something that's um, been very important to me in, in my writing and, and thinking about how I can be a part of, you know, this new era and we're seeing so much progress now and, and having more diversity in kids books. But, um, you know, just in 2018, uh, there's a statistic that there were more books that had animals as main characters than there were books that had Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and Asian human characters combined. That was only in 2018, just two years ago. Um, and it's actually why I chose to, uh, part of the reason why I wanted to read Last Stop on Market Street. Um, it's a, again, sort of a rare, uh, still somewhat rare um, occurrence where you have both an author of color and an illustrator of color, as is the case for my book. And the main character is a little black child, right? And we just don't see that very often. Um, so I'm very proud to be committed to that work and to be a part of, you know, a lot of folks that are, are really, you know, changing changing the narrative to be uh, corny and make a, a book joke. But um, yeah, you know, I think we have a lot of work to do. And I, I hope parents and, and, and kids are thinking about, you know, diversifying your, your bookshelves, right? And thinking about who we are, are teaching our kids to aspire to and who we're showing them on the pages of these books. Thank oh, you. thank you. You dropped the pre-order link to my, my new book that's coming out in January. Thank you. Ambitious yeah. Girl. There's a link to both Ambitious Girl and uh, Kamala and Maya's Big Idea in the chat right now. And the um, you were able to sign some book plates for your first book, Kamala and Maya's Big Idea. So if you order some through Powell's today, we will include a signed book plate with that book um, when we send it out. Amazing. There is a question here about what um, kids can do to help Kamala and Joe, but I think the real question this person is asking is, how can kids get involved and what, and what should they be doing? to stay um, involved in activism and in their communities? Yeah, thank you. I love that question. And it's a, a question that really inspired me to write my book, um, my first book, which is all about having an idea, seeing a problem, seeing something that you wanna do something about and going and doing it, right? And thinking about um, where that may be. It may be in your backyard, it may be in your school, it may be in a presidential election, right? There's so many ways that each of us can do something good in the world. And I love that you're asking that question because it means that you're thinking about it. Um, and if you remember, you know, one of the big lines in the book was that no one can do everything, but everyone can do something, right? Um, so start somewhere. It's okay to start small. My grandmother always taught me that I had a responsibility to just do something. And it, it, does, it doesn't have to be a big, huge, you know, starting a big, huge movement or even, you know, calling yourself an activist. It is whatever um, works for you and what makes you feel like you're making a contribution, right? So um, if you're a kid and you want to get involved in a presidential uh, election, there are lots and lots of ways for you to do that. Um, including talking to your family members who are old enough to vote, um, who are eligible to vote and asking them if they have a plan to vote, um, helping them find resources to vote. There's a website called, um, what is it? Iwillvote.com where you can find lots of resources around voting locations, early vote um, deadlines. Uh, what else? You can write letters uh, to the candidates, encouraging them um, uh, to you know, keep up the fight and, and wishing them good luck. You can write to your um, representatives, right? There's so many issues that are on the ballot in November and um, issues that affect e each of us in our own communities. And so there are ways that you can really use your vo your voice even if you're not old enough to vote. Um, so thank you for that question and, and just know that you have so much power uh, to use your voice and to influence everyone around you. And don't underestimate your ability to, you know, call up your, your cousin or your grandmother or whoever and say, hey, do you have a plan to vote? What are you going to do? I want to, I want to know what your plan is and, and just follow up with everybody and make sure that they are also um, participating because it's, uh, in my opinion, one of the most important elections of our lifetimes and uh, all of us, I think, have a role to play. Thank you for that. Uh, looks like we are done with questions there. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to welcome you today. Do you have anything you want to yeah. add? 
No, I'm just so grateful. It's um, just been such a wonderful, special journey becoming an author. It's not something that I uh, sort of had on my my wish list or you know aspirations of things that I thought I was going to uh, hope to accomplish in my life. And it's been one of the most um, special things that um, I've been able to do. And it was really, I think, um, kind of building on the question that was just asked. It was me responding to a moment, right? I didn't sort of have on my um, checklist of things like one day I want to be a children's book author instead it was you know looking around me and um, as I mentioned earlier seeing a lack of diversity in kids books and deciding I was going to do something about that right Um, part of it was uh, becoming a, a new parent and thinking about how we're raising our kids and how we're passing on values to them around uh, activism and social justice and using their voices, right? Again, building on the question that was just asked. So it's just been such a special journey and I'm so appreciative of communities like this and and Powell's and um, independent bookstores that are such important institutions in our communities. And so I'm just so thankful. Uh, thank you to everyone who who showed up for story time today and who, who does that um, uh, with Powell's and, and just, um, you know, supports local bookstores. It's so important. We know that, um, especially this pandemic, uh, local businesses and independent bookstores need our support. And I'm so proud to be a part of this community and, and thankful for everybody for showing up. Thank you very much, Mina. Mina's first book, which she just read from, is Kamala and Maya's Big Idea. And it sounds like in January, we'll have another opportunity to read one of Mina's books. Uh, The new book is called Ambitious Girl. I posted a link to both in the chat right now and you can find them at howls.com. Mina, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, I appreciate it. Have a good weekend, everyone. Have a good day, thank you. Bye.